This is The Michael Bryan Show. Hi everyone, welcome back to the show. And today I'm joined with Bobby Pham, who is the Chief Marketing Officer of Cardia Chain. So, Bobby, thanks for being a guest on the show and share a little bit about what Cardia Chain does. Hi, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, Cardia Chain is a blockchain based in Vietnam. Um, yeah, we are, I'd like to call it, tell everyone that we're the leading blockchain ecosystem in Southeast Asia. Our mission is mass adoption for Web3 technology. So that's like the quick elevator pitch about us. You started in a slightly more corporate environment before you found cryptocurrency and blockchain, didn't you? So share a bit about how you got started in the crypto space. Well, how I got started in the crypto space specifically. So I guess uh, my corporate, my corporate, I guess, environment or endeavors kind of ended around 2015. Right? So from 20, 2006 to 2015, I uh, worked at different marketing agencies doing digital marketing, primarily SEO um, and Google ads. And then in 2015, I made a pivot from working in the SEO space and moving over to affiliate marketing, right? And namely, truthfully, it was mostly Black Hat. Um, I didn't know it was Black Hat until I actually started working in the industry and realized, oh, the guy that I work for does Black Hat stuff. So then I realized, you know, that, that's what we were doing. But, um, you know, a, a lot of really bright guys in, in the Black Hat space. And I think um, I found that these guys are typically kind of ahead of the curve in terms of like new trends, new technology, new new trends i guess i guess you could say um yeah. and obviously crypto was one of those newer trends back in 20 you know i think some of my friends started like back as early i think as 2014 2015 and um that's kind of how i started getting into crypto is you know, these are a lot of these are my peers and they're always talking about it of course like hey you know like hey what are you up to nowadays like what, what you know what marketing angle what, what marketing thing are you doing like, oh man i'm all doing crypto now i'm like oh what's this crypto thing everyone keeps talking about so, yeah, so I think, um, you know, I got into crypto pretty much the end of 2017, early 2018, kind of at the peak of that bull run. Um, obviously, you know, had some big losses like everyone else during that, that entered during that time. So I pretty much took a big break from it until about maybe, I think, mid 2020-ish. Yeah, mid or late 2020-ish. No, sorry. Yeah, mid 2020 is just kind of when I got back into things here. Just started slowly investing again. My peers, my friends were talking about it. You know, they were, you know, shilling me, shilling me some some, I guess, some, some coins I should get into. And uh, a couple of those did pretty well. And, you know, uh, that's how I got into investing into the crypto industry, I guess. Uh, so. Well, what I thought I'd get your opinion on or your perspective on is when I first heard of the crypto space, the Bitcoin space, it came across like a network marketing thing <laughs> at the time. And I'm someone that would get 20 emails a day about this Bitcoin thing that they want you to take advantage of or this huge opportunity that's disguised as just they're making money off you, essentially. And that would have probably put off a lot of people when it came to getting started early, just because it was new, the quality might not have been so high, and that was how it initially got known to me. Is that still the case? Is that how you would picture it as a network marketing thing? And how do you see it progressing? How do you see it developing over time? Because now it's a lot more respected than what it was, even when some people still don't really know what it is yet. Hmm, that's a good question. I think I'd like to think that we're probably past the point where I think it has that network marketing feel. I think most people have come to accept that the industry is, you know, I think uh, for better or worse, or hopefully for better, uh, you know, that, 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 you know, that they, they accept that the industry is real and it is here to stay. Um, so I think that, so I think most people, you know, if you're approaching someone new or they're trying to sh like, you know, sell someone new, I don't think it'll come off as too network marketing. Uh, uh, but I will say that if you're in the industry or if you're just getting started, actually starting to like actually actively participate, whether it be someone working in the industry or even just as your casual or beginner investor, then you're probably going to have a lot of people that I think will probably, you'll probably run into a lot of situations where people are probably trying to oversell you something or sell you something that's probably not really what they're selling. Um, so 
Yeah, that would be my response to that. So I think, yeah, you know, I think, you know, if you're walking down the street, that person, you know, because I think despite the growth of the industry, it's still kind of niched off, still kind of niched, I guess. You know, even now that I work in the industry, it's very difficult to try to still market or sell crypto to like the person that's someone that's not in the space. It's very challenging still. So that would be my response to that. I don't know if I exactly answered the question, but uh, yeah, hopefully I you know, gave some answer to it. It's interesting when your background in, in marketing kind of tips over into the crypto space and it's just interesting to see how, how things have developed and, and your thoughts on how the marketing has changed. What I found particularly with this is someone can mention that a coin is doing really well, let's say. And other people will essentially dive in on it, try and take advantage of it, which is a version of shorting it. I think that's the word that I'm looking for, where the fact that they've mentioned it has caused a lot of people to get in on it, which then causes the price to go up. And then the original person that mentioned it sells all of their assets and makes a lot more money than they initially put in just because they've mentioned it. So it's becoming this, everyone dives in, inflates the price, and then the select few that know that this is going to happen is going to then sell and take advantage of it. It's almost like network inflation marketing slash promoting something that you would initially benefit from. I see that going on all the time. I'm sure you will see it going on a lot more than me. Is that causing this confirmation bias thing where if enough people say it you know people say it's amazing that's then why it ends up that way yeah i mean i think you know as you mentioned one i think what you're describing i think is um speculation certainly can influence you know the value of certain digital assets or certain coins right so yeah and i think you know even what you what you just described here yeah i mean you know it does happen at the very highest levels where you have some you know I guess you could say some quite influential entities, you know, influencing, you know, probably some of the bigger media outlets to release certain types of news to, you know, influence the price one way or the other. Um, so I think truthfully, though, this even happens in traditional financial markets as well. It's just not probably as transparent, you know, because there is regulation in, in, involved. Um, so they're not able to get away with it as easily. But you know, crypto is still very much the wild wild west. So this stuff does certainly. Um, so. Uh, Speculation can certainly, you know, have a lot of impact on on price movement and, uh, you know, the behavior of, of traders and investors that don't know any better. So, that is something to be wary wary of. Um, but once you get more experience in the space, um, you certainly kind of like recognize it. You certainly are able to recognize these things, and you tend to start to ignore it. Like you kind of start developing your own strategies for investing mm -hmm. or trading. If you know, if if you are so, a lot of times, you know after being burned by exactly what you've described, you know, quite a few times, you just kind of take your own approach and just kind of ignore like all the noise. And, um, you know, now that I actually work in this space as well, you know, I'm no longer just a casual investor. I have a better idea of like how things work uh, behind the scenes. So I can kind of, you know, like, you know, I'll see certain projects being talked about. I even see people talking about like us as a project. I'm like, these guys, what are they talking? About? I have no idea what they're talking. About. That's totally not exactly what they're saying. Is like, what are they getting this information from? So like, um, so that now, now that I've worked in this space, I'm like, man, now I turn. I will definitely not listen to any of these guys on YouTube anymore, except for, you know, except for the ones that I personally know I have a relationship with. So yeah, I wonder how someone can actually get through the noise using all of the more traditional methods like news and media outlets and all those things. I'm sure it's very closely related to things like stocks and shares and the news will cause a value of a company to go up and down, that sort of thing. So it's all very driven by the awareness of the thing. Anyway, I think everything's built like that. Is it something that we can actually navigate? Is it something that you can speak to some kind of advice or principles that you use today to navigate the space in a more effective way than I guess I would? What would you tell someone that's sick of hearing all of the smoke and mirrors that just wants something a bit more realistic a bit more perhaps refined or clear because if you see one thing and then see something that contradicts it you still don't really know where you stand or where you sit with it so help someone else get 
their grips on it because there's a lot of people that are probably struggling and being burned by these short-term gains by other people? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. So I think for, for, for first and foremost, like, you know, for someone that's just coming into the space, like, and if you, you know, if you want to, like, try to avoid, you know, the, uh, like, I would say, one, definitely probably not go to YouTube as your first source of information, because there's a lot of people that, you know, are just you know, saying things that, you know, probably I don't think are very qualified to say things that well. Um, so I can say, so, so one, avoid that as a, probably your primary source of information. And the second thing is, you know, first, like, I would say, you know, like, I think some people, I even still talk to some people, now they talk to me, they still have some doubts, like, how do you know crypto is here to stay? And, you know, I always say, well, I mean, do you think these really big companies like BlackRock are going to enter a space that they think is going to die anytime soon, right? You know, BlackRock just recently, I think, had a deal with Coinbase. I forgot what it was, how many billions of dollars it was. This is like the biggest money manager and company in the world. So like they're definitely not coming to space unless they, you know, have a lot of confidence or know something. So one, like the space is here to stay, right? So I mean, the space is here to stay. I mean, a lot of big money is coming in. A lot of institutional money is coming in. Tesla isn't buying a billion dollars with a Bitcoin if they thought it was just going to disappear. Um, the other thing I would like to add in terms of, you know, how to make, how to cut through the noise is, you know, I think, I think sometimes we complicate, you know, complicate this process more than, than it needs to be, right? So one, you know, I like to look at projects that have reached a point where like, it's hard to turn back. So let's take, for example, Facebook, right? Facebook is, is so big now. I mean, they've probably, they had like a, quite a few scandals now. The analytical scandal, the Anna, Cambridge Anal, Anna, analytic scandal was one did even a phase them, right? Because they just have too many users. Like they've reached a point where it's very difficult to, for them to lose, right? They have a lot of cash, a lot of influence. So I will look at such projects like that in the crypto space, which is pretty much Bitcoin. It's not quite a project, but it's just, you know, it, Bitcoin has reached a point where it's probably not going anywhere. Ethereum, same thing. Um, Binance, another one here. And they have a whole, a lot of cash here. So like, um, just use, I think, what I like to call, I guess, you know, uh, I, I guess common sense investing decisions, or at least these are the ways that I approach it. I don't know if this is common sense. Like, I don't, you know, I've learned to not really just to try to go by, with my own style of, of, of making investment decisions. So, yeah, I mean, just ask yourself, what are the biggest companies in the space? Who's running behind them? How much money do they have? Right? It's, you have a lot of money. It's really hard to lose. So, and I would probably start there before you really start investing in any more riskier or, or, or speculative coins, like just you know, do your own research and just ask yourself who are the biggest companies and, and, and start there and really get a feel for the space before you start branching out. There is a question that has been burning a hole in the back of my mind a little bit. And the question that's really standing out is, are people that are in the space propping up the industry? Like if it wasn't as marketed in a way that it is, would it go away because no one would invest in it? It's almost like the people's industry in a way. It's very community driven. Everyone's buying it, selling it, creating its own little ecosystem. Would it simply go away if people were not as invested in the system? Like if no one benefited financially from it, would it still be there? And I'm aware that that's pretty much every industry if no one buys it no one invests in it it doesn't stay it doesn't stay anyway so is it something that is simply smart marketing on whoever was behind the pr of blockchain and crypto did a really good job of trying to get people in and then they'll naturally want to stay or do you see a world where if no one really invested in it would it go away a lot quicker than people think so yeah, I do think uh, it's currently I mean, the market, the, the industry is still kind of. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I would say the words like it would. I don't know if I would say the phrase it would go away, but I certainly would say that. The much of the industry does still make a lot of decisions based on like the conditions of the market. Essentially, you know, are people actively putting money in the market or not? Like you know, as soon as as soon as the market started going bare, like a lot of crypto companies started like you know cease ceasing, you know, slowing down with hiring, slowing down with a lot of decisions that they were making uh, normally. 
Um, and just like when the market was more bullish, like they were going on a hiring spree, investing a lot more aggressively in different companies and, and projects. So I guess to say, I mean, I guess I'll probably you know, tweak what you're saying and saying, yeah, the crypto market is certainly more sensitive to the market condition, the macro market conditions, you know, I, I guess. Um, so, but you know, I guess you just like as you mentioned, you know, you know yeah. it's also kind of tough to say as well, because I mean, you know, we are like most people believe we are entering like a global recession as well. Like, you know, we're even seeing the biggest companies in the world, like Facebook or you know Silicon Valley, putting a pause on freezing. And uh, I think that says a lot. <laughs> like, you know, when when these companies are probably the most aggressive <laughs> yeah, companies in the world hiring, and they're stop they're stopping on hiring, then it probably should you know probably you probably should pay attention to that. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I do think probably agree. I don't think you know the industry. Like I said, I do I do believe the industry's reached a point where it's not going anywhere. But it is certainly more sensitive to the like market conditions of whether people are actively, you know, putting money into the industry or not. It does make me think actually that it's going to put some people off because of the lack of safety that I guess is caused by the <laughs> speculation you mentioned before. So, like, if it wasn't purely speculative, there's probably a percentage where it's not. But let's say it's seventy percent speculative. That's something that's highly influenced by just what people say, just the words people use can can cause it to go up and down, which I can't imagine every industry is is like that. Is there an antidote to that whereby it becomes a bit safer for people, a bit more investment long term driven? Like when you think about investments in, let's say, stocks and stocks and shares, let's say, as an example, that will typically not fluctuate as much even if things go sour in the news, it'd have to be bad for a long time for it to really just dip as much as Bitcoin has been reported to dip, let's say. Is it something that can happen that way when eventually it will become stable over three to five years and maybe even more? Or do you think it's always going to be this way? Oh, no, I think certainly it's going to stabilize. I mean, I think any new industry, the, the internet went through this, right? Even the internet, you know, people, there was a time people were like, who the hell is going to use email? Who the hell is going to like build websites? Are you talking? There's a, there's a time that people were talking about the internet in the same way that they're talking about crypto now. Um, but I will agree that it is heavily speculative right now, like probably even greater than, you know, the 70%, probably even closer to arguably even 90%. Like the majority of the projects in the industry are like, you know, lacking real use case. I mean, even truthfully, you know, as someone that works in the space, like, you know, blockchain doesn't have a, like a really heavy use case uh, right, right now. Um, but, you know, that's just because I think the industry is just, is just, is just new. So it's difficult to try to find you know, a problem. I, I guess, I guess it's just difficult. I, I guess it's just the nature of being in a new industry, I suppose, you know? So I do believe that there will come a point where um, there'll be a lot less, specu- there'll be a lot more, a less, sensitivity to speculative information being released here um and to be honest i think um you know there's a lot of lack of professionalism in the crypto space here because it is so young right it's the wild wild west but that also presents a lot of opportunity as well right so i mean if 95 percent of the companies are you know bsing you or not or have any real use case to just come in and be a good company, right? Be transparent, offer good service, make it user friendly, make your product user friendly, easy to understand. And we're already seeing a lot of companies and products and crypto companies starting to do that, right? I'm like, um, during this during this run right here, like I, I as I, this is my second, no, sorry, this is truly actually my first bull run that I was part of, bull market that I was part of. Um, but now that I'm in the space here, I can certainly see more companies like that are being much more transparent about what they do, how they work, who their team is. So I'm already starting to see the industry starting to make some change in that direction in terms of reducing like speculation and trying to become more professional. Do you ever find that what people tend to hate about more traditional ways of doing things is there's a very, very big sense that a small collection of people have the majority of the wealth and finances and opportunities and all those things, which is partly why blockchain is so popular because it's decentralized. There's a lot less friction, a lot less control, a lot less influence over how you would decide and what the kind of things you would do with your money. 
and yet I picture it being how it's improved. Like if there's a bit of structure, a little bit of, okay, we need some rules here before we can actually navigate this thing, that can actually improve, as you say, the pro professional side of the space. Is that something that you would agree with? Do you think that we need some kind of cage around this thing to stop it from staying this way and actually increase the quality of what happens on the blockchain? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think like many people in this space prefer regulation for the very reasons that you described here, right? Um, I mean, you know, fortunately, like, you know, in Vietnam here, like Vietnam's government is quite pro-blockchain. I mean, in fact, our co-founder recently uh, was part, he, he it was part of um, helping to create what they call the Vietnamese Blockchain Association, which is an entity to help you know, create and regulate you know, the legal framework for crypto in, in Vietnam. Oh, so um, I think that, yeah, you know, us personally, for sure, we definitely will welcome some regulation to help reduce some of the speculative, you know, speculate, spec sensitivity to speculation and some of the, you know, in immaturity happening in the space, uh, I guess. Um, yeah, and that's, that's actually a lot of reasons. I mean, I think more companies, truthfully, more, a lot more companies want to enter the space, companies and government, but because there's a lack of clear legal framework, companies are hesitant in this space because of that. That's actually part of, that's actually why our co-founders went on to create uh, this entity and, and with the support of the government and the endorsement of the government. Um, is because initially that was the vision that we had was to work with enterprise companies to help, you know, provide blockchain as a service. And a lot of the issues we were running into is like, oh, I don't know about this blockchain yet. If, you know, yeah, I want to get in it, but we're just not sure about it. So, you know, they, they addressed that. And uh, so, so yeah, so I think um, certainly, I think many people in the space, probably the majority of people in the space do welcome, um, welcome some type of cage, I guess, you know, you said, or, 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 or frank, legal framework. Um, so that'll help reduce the volatility. That'll save a lot of industry. More people will come in. So it's a win-win for everybody. So what's stopping it from just being an online version of what we have already? Do we have to have limits that stop it from being too restrictive? Do we have to push back on certain rules and principles that are part of the old way, so to speak, to now want to be part of the blockchain because of the repercussions? How do you analyze things like consequences and how to picture a world where it's actually better than what we have already so that we stop it from just repeating itself, history just repeating itself? Well, I think the whole concept behind really blockchain to me is, you know, I guess, you know, I guess, so I, I guess that's probably twofold. It's really, I guess, transparency and decentralization, I, I, I guess. So, well, I always like to think of it, I guess, you know, I, I like to think of it like this. All right, so when we talk about Web 2 and we talk about Web 3, right? So we have Web 2, which is pretty much centralization, right? Web 3, which is decentralization, right? And I think proponents in the space, obviously, you know, there's you have people that are really far on this side and you have people on, on this side here, right? And I like to think of, I think about a family unit, right? And I think about the parents being the web two employees like Amazon, your Facebook. And I think about the kids or teenagers being, you know, the, the decentralized entities, right? Like, I don't, I don't think that the entire, all the decisions that the family has should be, rest, should, should be entirely made by parents. They probably should make a lot of decisions and arguably even the majority of the decisions, but not all of it. Just like I don't think then either the kids should be making many decisions either based for the, you know, based for the family either, right? I do think that there's probably some yeah. decisions that are better made by the kids and better decisions made by the family and then better decisions that probably both have to come to an agreement on. So I am of the, mm -hmm. I am of the belief that there should be some type of balance in between and probably constant management uh, between these two dichotomies here, right? So I, I, I guess when you ask the question of like, you know, like, I mean, what, what's the point of this? Like, well, why, why do we really need this technology? Well, I think there is some need for it, right? I mean, there is a little bit too much centralized power. And we've kind of seen some issues with that. Uh, at the same time, decentralization is kind of inefficient. Like, it's not inefficient. And, you know, sometimes it's not good to put big, important decisions into the hands of people that don't have a lot of experience or don't really know what, what, they're, what they're doing either. So I always believe to manage these two economies is better than trying to go one way or the other. So... To answer your question, I do think there is a need for, you know, 
for for having this 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 idea of what three and decentralization but i wouldn't go like balls to the wall this side either yeah <laughs> there are some people that i've had the chance to have a conversation with around some improvements that could be made and i want to see blockchain being better than the old way like the, the web 2 way i think blockchain is probably the future but then i think we need to have some kind of rules otherwise it's just going to be a crazy place as you said but the the wild wild west and what someone mentioned and it did make me think is a financial consequence of how you operate in the space almost like a, a fine structure through crypto so let's say someone sells something and doesn't deliver on the promise there needs to be a legal system in place there needs to be a proof system in place some kind of justice system regarding the the sale or transaction and then there needs to be some kind of fine in place for someone that breaks the the rules there needs to be some kind of way of doing that because it's all virtual so I, i can't imagine a space where unless it's mature enough when people will start going to prison and going to jail for something they do on the blockchain because that would probably be something that goes against the decentralization of government start putting you in jail because of transactions that you've made that sort of thing so i seem quite hesitant to say that that's going to be a real thing anytime soon but i do think that we need to have something that limits people's ability to do whatever they want whenever they want as often as they want and anyone can say and do anything and there's no consequences almost like social media today it's rare that someone will have any real life consequences for the things that they're saying no i mean i i agree i always like i you know i am i'm certainly pro having some some central support or, or some some authority figure coming around and policing things a little bit here otherwise as you mentioned like you know people can do whatever they want right as well i've always kind of like you know I, as someone that grew up in western culture with the western with western mindset I think even, you know, the pandemic kind of showed like, you know, some challenges of, you know, of, I guess you could say even limiting some freedoms truthfully, right? You know, that, you know so, all right. Um, so, yeah, you know, I certainly agree that like, you know, there certainly needs to be some type of policing and regula- regulation in this space and really, you know, truthfully in any space in the industry, all right? otherwise, you know, you're going to have people that are going to get hurt or lose, you know, lose money or get really, really impacted. So, yeah, I, I certainly agree. That does actually bring up something to do with digital marketing generally. And I wonder if you can share your thoughts on this idea of people being able to say anything without a whole lot of consequences. There is a very, very real thing of smoke and mirrors involved in marketing. Lots of industries are built on market something very well, even if it's not very good and it will do well because of how it's marketed and how it's positioned and all of those things can you speak to that can you speak to hopefully trying to move away from it is it a real thing in a lot of industries i know the couple where it probably is more often happening how do we get past that how do we actually market things correctly which is just a way of saying what it is what it does what are the benefits who is it for rather than having to inflate everything all the time yeah, well, I think truthfully, I mean, the, so to answer your question, you know, for sure, I, I would, you know, welcome some, you know, better, like, oh, you know, if we could, if we could regulate all of, you know, or the majority of digital marketing or the BS that happens in digital marketing out there, yeah, you know, I certainly would welcome it. And again, this is even someone who can, someone coming from the black hat space here, right, someone who had some, some degree of success in doing black hat stuff. But I will say really the, the best way is to really, I think, educate the community, educate the public, right? And truthfully, the good thing is the public is starting to become more, I mean, smarter anyways. Like I'm talking to my nephew, I remember, and my nieces about you know, who are 13 and 12, and I'm having what I perceive as like an adult conversation. Like they're having the awareness, like, yeah, you know, my mom said this, but I think I think she always said that because, you know, she just wanted us to be happy or like not really reveal her feelings or something like that. Like, I remember thinking like, what? Like, like this, like my, 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 my friends would be able to recognize this. How can you recognize this, right? But the point I'm trying to make is that like, as people become more educated and smarter, they're going to recognize like, yo, this marketing message has a sound right. Like this, there's no way this is right. Or this doesn't seem right here. Right. 
So because of that, as people become more educated, your marketing messages and your marketing angles aren't going to work. Like your, your BS infl- overinflated case studies or whatever aren't going to work. So you might as well do what everyone's not doing and just start being honest and transparent. And people tend to really actually gravitate towards that more. People are now starting to appreciate more authenticity, a little bit of human, a little bit of error, a little bit of typo here and there and stuff like that, right? You don't need to wear you know, suits or any more. People, in fact, are probably like, why, why are you overly dressed up right now? That doesn't seem like, you know, I, I think that's where <laughs> things are heading. So I think, I think ultimately just continuing to educate consumers, educating the public, one, and as they become smarter, you're exaggerated marketing angles or your scams aren't going to work anymore because um, people are just getting smarter to this. So you got to do, you got to do the hard stuff. You're actually got to build a good product or good service. <laughs> so. Do you think that's kind of like people are generally lazy, like they'd rather make something look good and sound good rather than actually being good? Do you think it's just become too normalized to say, well, I can say anything, do anything, write anything, as long as it sells more of the thing that I'm trying to sell. Yeah, I think so. I think probably the whole majority of why people do that is because, you know, yeah, they are a lazy lack of effort. I mean, I think to us, we were all probably guilty of that to some degree, right? You know, for sure myself until, you know, I started getting to it and realized like this isn't working or, or, or eventually it catches up to you. I think that's what happened to me. Like eventually it's kind of just caught up with you. Like, man, I should have just like, you know, just took the heart out in the beginning it would have saved me some headaches now that I'm dealing with. So yeah, I do agree that the majority of it is, is lazy. People feel like, you know, it's, you know, I think sometimes also for me, you know, you would hear the advice of like, you know, take action, like, you know, just, t- just take action. Don't think of some action is better than none. So I think sometimes people rush into doing things and, uh, you know, probably they'll probably just put up or whatever website, whatever ad and say whatever they want. And, uh, yeah, so that's probably, yeah, to answer your question, I think laziness is probably a big part of, um, of why why they do that. Do you see it ever going away then, this idea that, well, I don't really have to work at it. All I've got to do is create the right pictures, create the right videos, get somebody in to write the text or copy or sales letters or whatever it is, and then just put it out there as much as we can and that is it i get a funny feeling that a lot of people like to market they like to sell but very few actually like to deliver and actually like to do the thing and they'd rather market the work rather than do the work yeah i mean i i certainly it'll probably be a while before it i so to answer your question i do think that it'll be you know, I don't think things will ever fully go away. I think you're always going to have some degree of scam or like, you know, lack of truthfulness in products, services, businesses. Um, but I do think that, uh, you know, it will, it will become less. It will certainly become less. You'll certainly start seeing more quality business out there. And truthfully, I, mean, I think you can say that now. Like, I mean, if you, like, as I, you know, as I research more businesses and companies to work with, whenever I'm looking for like a marketing vendor or whatever, and I would say probably there was a time where most of the stuff that I read like was just not good or you know low quality websites. But now I'm seeing a lot of like mission driven companies and like people seeing their face and being honest about what they're offering. So I really want to say I actually think it's kind of moving in a in a better direction. Um, so like back in I think the early 20s or 30s or whatever, I was watching some documentary and like man, they were saying like all kinds of wild stuff and like they were just saying stuff in the like you know like farmers i think were like putting out like totally unexpired meat or some shit like that or whatever so uh <laughs> yeah okay like, it was like some wild stuff here so but you know we've we've certainly moved a lot for a lot a lot along much uh, away from that or, or improved from that should i say so i think uh there's no reason why to think that we won't continue to progress in the right direction i'd love your opinion on trying to market something sell something promote something without this elephant in the room that is vested interest lots of people promote things that they have a vested interest in i do it i'm sure you do it loads of people listening do it as well it's almost like the vested interest colors what you say how you act because you benefit from it you're more likely to do it which is a psychological fact in a lot of ways but then we want there to be a world when people would be honest truthful 
more transparent. I don't think people can ever be 100% transparent. But how do we shift the dial away from we'll only do things, only say things because we benefit, only do the things that we will get some kind of return on and we just do the right thing regardless, even if we don't benefit? Yeah, I think, you know, fortunately, yeah, I think, I think what we want to tell people is, yeah, you know, I, I, one of the mentors that I read or I guess follow is uh, he has this like concept. His name is Dr. D. Martini, one of my friend's mentors actually, and she put me on him. And he has this concept of what they call sustainable value exchange, right? And it's something I always try to keep in mind, right? If you want value, you got to put out value, right? And the amount of value you want in return, you have to put out a, you know, at least equal value to that, right? So I would tell people that like, you know, truthfully, like, I, you know, I do many things, you know, I am financially or value or I want something in return. Like, I'm not going to deny that. I do a lot of like the majority of things that I do, I want something in return. But I know that if I want that thing in return, I have to give value, right? So I've trained myself, hey, you know, if I want to get paid, I need to make sure I earn earn, earn the pay. Um, so I would say that uh, one, the, the, the first thing is one, just accepting the idea, the, accept the concept in your head that if you want value, you better give value, right? And you know if you're giving value or not. Like, don't lie to yourself, right? Don't be lying about it. Oh, well, I showed up today at work. That's not enough. Like, oh, that's not enough, man. Put energy into it, right? Like, did you put energy into this? Like, did you give it some effort, right? If you did, then you'll reward it for it, whether it comes through that particular channel or in the future, you know, because you have this experience now. So one really embody this idea of sustainable value exchange, lead with the value. And I promise value will come back. I always believe that. And two, if you like, okay, if the, so, the, so now you have the idea. One, now you know, okay, I need to give value. So the next question is like, well, what value do I give? Like, what value do I have? First of all, everyone has value. Like everyone has value, right? Everyone has value. If you don't know what it is, then what are you getting paid for to do right now? Like whatever job you have, that's, you know, that's, you're getting, someone's giving you money to do that very thing. So that you must be decent at it, right? So I would say, if you're trying to figure out what to give value in, I guess, try to choose the things that are most aligned with who you are and what you feel good about doing, right? I have a digital marketing agency, but I'll be honest that I don't enjoy doing client work. Like it is far from what I enjoy, but I happen to know it and I happen to be decent at it. All right. And now, nowadays I'm actually trying to change and, and pivot the company direction because, you know, I found that I, I can't sustain doing this because it's not what I really enjoy doing. Right? And what I enjoy doing is really helping and helping people. I enjoy being in some type of mentor mentorship role. So right now we're trying to pivot and trying to create info products and help people make more money online, targeting freelancers specifically, because that's exactly the path I took. I, went, I didn't have anything to do. I quit my job, went freelancing, and eventually went from freelancing to scaling my agency, building an agency, et cetera. And this is an area that I genuinely enjoy doing. If you, if someone asks me, hey, Bobby, I'll work with you. Can I come ask you questions once a week? I'll do whatever you ask. I'll work for you for free. I would genuinely enjoy helping them and probably not ask anything of in return. So I would say try to find what you're valuable at that's also aligned with what you enjoy doing like what would you do for free right well then that's probably what you should be doing because then you'll do it forever or you'll you'll, you'll try to get really good at it and this is actually how you'll make the most you know money or the most in return i, I would say so yeah i know it's kind of a long-winded answer but i hope that answers you know helps answer what you were asking some people are clearly better at balancing these questions than than other people and it gives me the impression that those that do really well have a very, very clear path to that. They're very, very clear on their answers. And it makes me think, how do you think about answering these questions? How do you think about clarity? How do you think about trying to be as specific as possible, trying to constantly strive to get clearer on these answers? Things like, what would you and money up from what are you best at what do you enjoy how do you try to really nail it down because so many people struggle with coming up with any answer at all and then some people may have three or four answers and they can't quite nail it down to one is there anything that you do yourself to help you refine the answers help you refine and actually make decisions well i think first so I think probably what I didn't do enough of, 
uh, and even to a degree now, although I, well, I, it, 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 earlier in my career, I guess, was setting aside time to think and reflect, right? And treating, answering these questions like a, like a job that I have to, or a project that I have to, like, all right, Bobby, you know, you're gonna spend tonight or you're gonna spend tomorrow night or this weekend just sitting there planning out your career, what you're doing, you know, like what you should be, what the company should be going or, or what you're good at or what you should be, which niche you should be choosing if you're in, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever life, midlife crisis answer that question that you're trying to answer, you need to sit down and I think really take some time to think about it. Like, I don't think people literally just get by themselves and just think, right? They probably, the first thing most people do is like, well, let me go talk to somebody. Let me go ask a mentor. Let me go ask for advice. Dude, like all the answers you have are really actually inside you. I know that sounds a little cliche or, or, or corny, but it, tr it, tr it, tr it truly is, right? So first, before you go seek outside advice or, or answers, like just think internally at first. Like just really think about it, right? Like really go through that, okay, what are the things that I bought? Like, you know, if I if had all the money in the world, what would be the productive things I would be doing right now? Okay, so that's a start, right? So that's a start. So you know, again, earlier, I'm, well, I mean, what am I getting paid to do right now? What aspects of that? Do I, do I like any aspects of that? No. Okay. Right. Well, have I ever volunteered or anything before? Why did I volunteer for that? Did I actually enjoy that? Maybe, you know, I think these are the type of questions that I, I, I personally do uh, when I am having, or trying to figure out the answers. So, and if you are truly have done nothing, then, which is hard for me to believe if you're listening to this pod, podcast or like any of these podcasts, really, then, I would say get out there and start doing stuff like go start get a job like get a job and start doing something right like you gotta you gotta figure this like you gotta if you don't if you don't if you've done nothing like you're, or maybe if you're just in high school you're just getting out of high school and trying to figure out what your next move is well then go get a job go work for someone go find someone that you admire and, and that's in the in business and say and just beg them to work for free so i'll do whatever it takes to work for free like i'll do you know whatever that, that's actually what the first step i took when i quit my my client agency career and went into the affiliate marketing space there was like this guy that i really admired the first email I sent him, he totally ignored. And it was like, and it was because it was an overly long, emotionally written email, which I had the ability to recognize a year later. And I emailed him again saying, hey, you know, I realized <laughs> I sent you a long, worthless email. I don't know why I did that. I guess yeah. I was going through some tough times. Uh, but he admired that. He admired the fact that I sent him an email again. And I literally, the email was like, hey, um, I know this is a little off topic, but the email was, hey, look, this affiliate marketing stuff is hard as crap. The only thing, I will work for you for free. The only thing I ask is if I ever have a question, will you answer it? He's like, all right, so sure. So I guess, you know, and through that, I was able to kind of find my affiliate marketing career and go that path, which eventually led me to, you know, different doors and paths and to where I am today. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is for those that are having trouble figuring it out, one, take some time to reflect. Like put, like treat it, like treat your reflection time as something serious and ask yourself these questions. Um, and then think about it. And then the next thing would be then actually, you know, if you don't have, you know, anything, if you really have done nothing that you perceive as valuable, then go get a job or go figure, you know, go work for somewhere or work for someone that you admire or, or work for a friend or, or whatever, even if it's for free. Like get above your ego, let your ego go and, uh, you know, start trying to find out the answers to these questions. When I went through a similar process to yourself, when I was reflecting on things like that, what I realized very quickly is when you're deciding between something that's good and something that could be better, that is so much harder than discerning between what you hate and what you don't hate. Like good for great is so much harder than terrible for not so bad. It's almost like we've got this <clears throat> difficulty with, okay, this is good what if the other thing over here could be great? And the way I would describe it is you've got to pick one. <laughs> Even if, let's say you do it for six months, and if it doesn't work, you try the other thing. And you, you constantly are in this state of doing good things and potentially great things until eventually you do some combination of the three or four that you've, struggle to find one thing because you found four and you think right maybe i combine them maybe it is doing something once a week and doing seven different things 
once a week with your time. Maybe it's not about picking one thing. Maybe it's about doing all of the things that you've landed on and you just dedicate a certain amount of time, energy, resources to those things and you do it that way and that becomes your life. And I think so many people have a hard time grasping the idea of it doesn't need to be just one thing. This idea that your life is just simply one thing is so difficult. Like I've got this show, I've got multiple other projects that I'm working on, I've got friends, I've got family. You're never able to just do one thing with your time. So no matter what, you're multitasking or you're juggling different things or you're trying to find time for friends, family, fun, money, business, companies, job, you name it. It's so hard to get around the fact that you're going to be spending your time doing multiple things, no matter what you decide to do. And the people that realize that, accept that, move on from that and actually try to get a handle on these different aspects, they're the kinds of people that, do better than it needs to be one thing and they never get this one thing and they wonder why well they think that they've got this one thing and then life happens and it turns out they need four or five to move forwards so they go from one to five and it never sticks with one as if it needs to be one and i'm not so sure it does what do you think yeah, I mean, I think, you know, what you're uh, probably, it sounds like you're talking about is like, you know, I think, you know, you have this advice that's often given out here is that you need to focus on, you know, focus or pick one one thing. And I think, um, you know, for some people that it's a little scary because that means if you have to pick one thing, that means you have to let go of a lot of things, which can be really challenging. You know, detachment is challenging for most people. Um, but ultimately, I... You know, I mean, your life, your life is your life, right? Like I, I live my life. I, I, I try to live life thinking, look, man, you got the only thing I know for sure in life is I got one of it. So if I know that, if that's as fast fact, if I, if I know that I have at least one, I guess depending on what religion you are, then let's live this one to however, however you want to live it, right? I want to see much of the world. I want to, I want to experience a, a good life. I want to do a lot of different things, but um, I will, I, 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 I will add that the one constant or fundamental virtue that I think you need to maintain if you want to be successful in anything is consistency, right? So if you're going to do seven different things and you consistently work on those seven different things or find a system that where you can consistently make meaningful progress on all of those. Um, so I think whatever it is that you do, just be consistent about it. And as you mentioned as well, give it an honest shot, right? You can't, I mean, so many times, like, you know, for example, these freelancers that I'm starting to try to like <laughs> help out and like, you know, I'll see like, you know, they're mostly up, it's all upwork freelancers. That's where I specialize in. And everyone's just like, um, yeah, you know, I'm not getting any jobs here. Check out my profile, you know, and I sent some proposals and it didn't work. I'm like, well, how many did you send? Like five. Like, yo, like, come on, like, guys. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, five. I mean, the point being, it, yeah, so the point being, it, the point being is like, um, you know, you get one life, do with what you want, whether it's like multiple things or just focus on one, you know, do, do whatever really allows you to consistently move in a forward direction. As you mentioned, I'm similar to you that I need to have multiple things going on to keep me, I think, at my max peak. Now, I have found the limits to that. Like I found that I don't think I can do more than two because I'm really struggling with two, truth, truthfully. And I do probably think that for most people, if you're just starting out, you probably should focus on one, truthfully. Like you probably should pick one if you are just starting out and trying to like kind of get the hold of getting like one thing moving before you try to take on too many at a time. But, you know, hey, I mean, a lot of people have been able to start multiple projects and balance things at the same time. They do it just fine. So um, I, 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 I'll add that in there, I guess. So that's my response to that. I want to sidestep a little bit to Cardi Chain because the conversation that we've had so far makes me think that this is one of the main things that you spend your time on. This is one of the things that you dedicate yourself to. And yet the conversation that we had before makes me think, how is Cardia Chain different? What convinced you that this was worth adding to the space, given everything that we've spoken about? What makes Cardia Chain different? Well, I think, you know, our approach to the space, like, I think... You know, I think a part of it is the people that I work with, I guess, one. So, you know, as I was debating on whether to, you know, start, you know, taking a serious role with Cardia Chain, 
And truthfully, this was really challenging for me because I created my agency because I did not want to have a schedule. I did not want to go into an office. I did not want to answer to someone. I wanted to wake up whenever I want, sleep as long as I wanted, right? So, you know, I knew this was going to be, you know, uh, a, a tough, like a difficult, uh, a decision that I had to really think about before I committed to it. But, um, you know, I also didn't want to take, turn on the opportunity to work in this space, a new industry. I mean, you know, if you're first to a new industry, you're going to get rewarded for that if you can figure that out. So what made the difference is as I was looking through the website, you know, um, so first, you know, the, the co-founder is a friend of a friend and after meeting him and having a couple of talks with him, you know, he was a really smart guy. Like, I really enjoyed talking to him and I can tell he's truly passionate about, you know, trying to spread yeah. uh, adoption of blockchain technology. And he's also really passionate about trying to put, you know, trying to make Vietnam stand out and put Vietnam on the map, which is also things that I'm passionate about as well. Um, but, you know, cardia means heart, right? So cardia chain, the selling point of cardia chain is there, you know, so in the, I'm not sure, for sure how familiar you are with, 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 with blockchain, I guess, lingo or, or, or tech on terms, but, you know, one issue in the space here is there's like so many different blockchains, right? I guess you could say, you know, you could different, you can compare blockchains like, like, like mobile carriers, right? How do you know whether to choose, you know, one, one mobile carrier or not? They all really essentially do the same thing, right? Um, so you have the same issue in, in, in the blockchain space. You have tons of these different, I guess, blockchain protocols, right? So what blockchain, do, uh, what Cardia Chain does is they aim to connect them, right? So through Cardia Chain, you can connect these different blockchains so that you don't have to like be limited only to Ethereum or, uh, or, by, or the BNB chain, or the Binance blockchain, I guess, right? With Cardia Chain, you can get access to both, right? So Cardia, the word cardia literally means heart, right? As you, if you think about the heart, it connects all the organs in the body, all the blood and all the blood vessels, you know, send, you know, blood to all the different parts of the body. So that's kind of like the, the idea behind cardia chain. So when I read that, when I read that, you know, that's something that I really resonated with because I'm like, oh, yeah, I kind of consider myself like a connector, right? I kind of like yeah. to connect different ideas, tasks, pull people. Um, but, you know, seeing that the co-founders really wanted to pursue this mission, like they really wanted to, like it just, I, I guess by pursuing this problem, it just shows the passion that they have for, for the space and the passion they have for wanting to do something special in Vietnam. And I guess that's really what dragged me or that's what like, you know, made me want to, you know, take a shot at working and, and working with Cardio Chain and, and seeing this through. So what kind of things do you do then if you combine blockchains is that allowed? Do you have to sign waivers, disclaimers, all that kind of thing? Because it seems like they'd all want to keep everything within their own system, within their own nodes and, and that sort of thing. So how do you actually do that? How do you actually connect them together? So, I mean, blockchain is all open source, right? So like, you know, the Ethereum code is out there and anyone can like make modif modifications to it, right? So like, you know, like, you know, in terms of like having to like to you know, ask Ethereum for permission to do these things, you know, that you can just, you know, the code is out there and you can just set up some code where your blockchain can communicate with Ethereum's blockchain or blockchain B or blockchain C, et cetera. Um, now the question of, well, why would Ethereum want this? Well, yes, I mean, as a blockchain, you do want most of the traffic on your own network, but that also can turn away from some, that also can turn away people as well, right? There are people that are hesitant to commit to one protocol because like, man, if I build on just Ethereum, I can only interact with Ethereum, you know, Ethereum users or Ethereum programs, right? But man, if I can build on, you know, let's say a Cardia chain, at least I can interact with all these other blockchains as well. So I'm not just limited to, to one, right? Just like imagine if you were to pick one phone carrier, like would you like only being able to talk to people on that carrier, right? You'd want to be able to still talk to the other carriers too because your other friends might use other carriers too, right? So um, as Ethereum, you kind of know that and you're like, all right, well, you know, that makes sense. And yeah, I guess Cardia chain is not so bad. So should, yeah, yeah, sure. It'd be great we should, if we could connect to them, et cetera. And the, the fortunate thing is most of the space, truthfully, is actually really, really likes the idea of what we call, this is called interoperability or cross-chain. And most of the space wants that because we want data to be free flowing, right? If you ever notice that, you know, your phone, you can easily message someone on Messenger or WhatsApp or, you know, whatever all the other chat apps are seamlessly, right? It doesn't matter what carrier they use, um, doesn't matter what device they use, operating system they use. And that's what we want in the blockchain space as well.
I actually picture that being a way of stopping, let's say, Bitcoin as an example, from being this new version of less people having more of the the pie. You know, like if Bitcoin owns everything, then it's no different to what it has been before. What's stopping Cardia Chain from being the new version of that then? Like, is there anything that prevents this few people having almost everything? Is there anything that prevents these few people from having almost... Oh, okay. So are you asking... I guess maybe ask the question again, make sure I understand it. Yeah, so it, in a world where things like investors, billionaires, trillionaires exist, where they own the majority of the wealth, the finances, the capital, the resources, all those things, and that's part of the pull towards the blockchain technology. It's more decentralized, more people can have the opportunities, and it's all open source, as you mentioned. So it's almost like anything is possible in a way. And then when you brought up that cardio chain can connect things, that's in a way prevents it from happening again, where blockchain has most of the wealth or Ethereum or whatever else is out there in the future from owning most of the capital in this kind of history repeating itself scenario. But based on what you said there, is there anything that stops cardio chain from essentially just being the entity that that has most of the financials as well are you simply the middleman or do you have access to the financials as well Hmm. so with cardia chain i mean you know people would want to keep their assets because you know on cardia chain because it is easy to to transfer it to another blockchain like your ethereum or like your blockchain b or c or d or or e right whereas if you let's say keep your assets on let's say in ethereum while you can still move it around to other different blockchains, it's just not as easy, right? They, because that's not what their like goal is. That's not their, Ethereum is just trying to build a really good quality blockchain, right? Where you don't have to go like, well, why would you need to go? Like, Ethereum more so might have the perspective of, why do I need to really, you don't really need to go there because we kind of have everything you need, right? That would be how, that would be, so that would be why, so that, so I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, you know, like, you know, being interoperable, we want you to have the freedom to move your assets around, right? So that's like, that is our, that is our goal. Like, we don't want you to just keep staying with us. Like, yeah, you can keep your assets here, but you can freely move it around. We're not going to limit you or we're, we're going to actually even make it easier for you to move it, move around. And I think because of that, that becomes very attractive, right? So that becomes very attractive for users. People actually want to use this because we have that, we give you that freedom, which, you know, technically is kind of the ideology, the ideology behind blockchain cryptocurrency. So... It, it makes sense from a communication standpoint, I think, as well. Like, if we all communicate together, you would have the control to move things around as you see fit and do it in, in that sort of way, almost like how they communicate to each other rather than having it all in one place. Yeah, I guess you could say that, yeah. So how can people find out more about you, Bobby? There's been quite a lot that we've talked about today on the cardio chain and blockchain by here you're a basketball fan amongst other things how can people find out more about you thanks uh yeah so i'm probably most active i guess really on you know three social channels being twitter instagram and facebook or actually i would say instagram facebook and twitter mostly picked up twitter for crypto but yeah uh twitter my handle twitter handles the real b fam instagram the real b fam as well so yeah i would say you know hit me up or follow me on those two channels and you can probably see what I'm up to day to day. I kind of post miscellaneous stuff. I have you post your typical occasional inspirational quotes and guru type stuff that I see from other people that I follow. So thanks so much for being a guest on the show. Those that are listening, feel free to subscribe, share the show, tell others and also leave a review wherever you are listening in to your podcasts. Bobby, thanks so much for being a guest on the show. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. If you want to join a group of like-minded people that are all out to achieve their goals, their dreams, their aspirations, and they get the help and support from me and the other members, then my inner circle is for you. There's a link in the description for this episode to get two months free of the inner circle. So you set your membership up, you get two months free 
access. Hopefully I'll see you there and I look forward to helping you on your journey of achieving the life that you want.